we've studied and we've tried to identify ways to design solid fuel reactors to utilize thorium effectively, and it's very challenging. Their capabilities look, in terms of, of fuel utilization conversion ratio, look remarkably similar to light water reactors. Essentially, SINAT, at the Shanghai Institute of Applied Science, um, is, has a very aggressive program with uh, molten salt reactors. Um, they're, they're doing a two-pronged approach where they build solid fuel test reactors um, with pebble fuel, um, and also molten salt um, uh, dissolved thorium um, test thorium, reactors right as well. Thorium. Huh? Right. Thorium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thorium dissolve, dissolve thorium fuel so, in the molten salt. Okay. Um, similar to that uh, molten salt reactor experiment in America. So uh, why aren't we working on liquid uh, fuel? Well, our lab is, is specifically designed the PBFHR, the pebble fuel variant, right. and the idea... The United States in general. Oh, licensing. Licensing a liquid fuel reactor, commercial especially, in the U.S. right now is scary. Anything that's different, that's never been done before, it seems like in the nuclear field, everybody wants to be number two. This is one of the flaws with, that, that has impeded innovation in the nuclear energy technology area, which is that this is a first mover barrier. Because quite obviously, once the answer comes out as to how NRC will manage that sort of question, everybody knows what that answer is and, and everybody else can free ride. In 2010, some of you may remember, President Obama in a State of the Union address said, We need more production, more efficiency, more incentives. And that means building a new generation of safe, clean nuclear power plants in this country. And both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, stood up like he just talked about motherhood and apple pie or saluted the military. We're all at Oak Ridge. The morning that we showed up, one of the Oak Ridge guys came in with an announcement from the Chinese Academy of Science. We are going to do this. We're going to own the IP. So you would think someone in our government would say, maybe you shouldn't keep giving away this information. Coming back for what will be built, again, it's light water reactors. I don't understand how, what's going on here. Why are we spending money to build reactors based on the same concept that we have been building ever since uh, World War II? I believe that the light water reactors for the foreseeable future will be a bridge between the industry of today and an industry of tomorrow. What we've got is not a bridge to tomorrow, but a, but a protection of the status quo. The current system incentivizes reactor designers to develop their first projects outside of the United States. And in fact, this has already happened. NRC regulations specifically spell out prohibitions against fluid-filled reactors. You cannot operate fluid-filled reactor more than one megawatt without expensive license process. We'd like the demonstration facility to generate meaningful results for a full-size plant on the order of 20 megawatts thermal any smaller than that and it really it becomes a different machine yeah but just the, the thermal hydraulics even would be so different that it wouldn't really be a valid comparison canada has a, f uh, a fundamentally different regulatory environment for nuclear power which is i would say very progressive we do feel that we have a competitive advantage by pursuing this technology in canada specifically we don't do big science anymore here in the united states we don't china is India is, the Czech Republic is, Jan Ulich. He's got a great budget and he bought an obscene amount of fly for pennies on the dollar from Oak Ridge National Laboratories because he's doing big science over there. And we, we basically gave it away. Currently there is no way for us to build a prototype facility or move beyond the laboratory scale work that we're currently doing. We want more than anything to do this in the U.S., but we've been forced to keep an open mind with respect to the other, the other pathways we could take. My constituents were always asking me about this. Does thorium have a place in our nuclear future? I see no compelling reason to move towards a thorium cycle. Uh, there was a recent report done by the Nuclear Energy Agency of the OECD on thorium systems. Can you make them work? Yes, you can make them work. Is there an advantage to doing it? I haven't seen it. Does the OECD report evaluate Alvin Weinberg's concept of the molten salt breeder and identify technical challenges which may impede development? 
Of those 11 pages in a 133-page report, one sentence does so. This 1 gigawatt design was a thermal reactor with graphite-moderated core that required heavy chemical fuel salt treatment with a removal time of approximately 30 days for soluble fission products, a drawback that could potentially be eliminated by using a fast spectrum instead. In a fast spectrum reactor, uranium and thorium perform the same. In a solid fuel reactor, uranium is a superior choice. It is only in Alvin Weinberg's thermal spectrum molten salt breeder reactor that thorium's advantages become clear. Let's reword it for clarity. This one gigawatt design was a thermal reactor with graphite moderated core that avoided the drawbacks of fast spectrum by removing soluble fission products through the use of chemical fuel salt treatment. The successful breeder will be the one that can deal with the spent fuel most rationally, either by achieving extremely long burnup or by greatly simplifying the entire recycle step. This is kind of like a kidney for the nuclear reactor. This is how long it takes our spent fuel to reach the same radioactivity as, as natural uranium. It's about 300,000 years. If you can keep all the actinides out of the waste stream, then you can really, really shorten that to about 300 years. It's where it's positioned on the periodic table. It goes down the chain into different elements. But if you start a couple of steps to the left along the periodic table, inherently you take out most of the nasties in the waste. If you use thorium with this kind of efficiency, something really amazing becomes possible. Every cubic meter of the Earth has got a certain amount of uranium and thorium in it. It's about two cubic centimeters of thorium and half a cubic centimeter of uranium. If you can use thorium to the kind of efficiencies that we're talking about today, this has the energy equivalent of more than 30 cubic meters of the finest crude oil or anthracite coal. So this is like taking worthless piece of dirt anywhere in the world and turning it into multiple of the finest chemical energy resources we have. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. Now, good news is we don't have to mine average continental crust for thorium. You can see that uranium-235 is like on par with silver and platinum. Can you imagine burning platinum for energy? And that's what we're doing with our nuclear energy sources today. We're burning this extremely rare stuff and not thorium. As a natural resource, the appeal of thorium over uranium is that thorium has zero environmental cost to acquire. We can power our civilization on thorium without opening a single thorium mine. It is already a plentiful byproduct of existing mining operations. Leached by water, U compounds were widely dispersed, scattered far and wide. U compounds today are found as complex, dilute deposits containing tetra, penta, and hexavalent uranium. Unlike uranium, tetravalent thorium, and it's constantly tetravalent, resists weathering. Thorium thus remained concentrated where it first wound up, within easy reach. And your deposit has 8% rare earths. It may have 14% thorium. One rare earth, and usually one thorium atom. There's so much rare earths that we're throwing away because of thorium. Rare earth materials are used to make high-tech products like advanced batteries that power everything from hybrid cars to cell phones. We want our companies building those products right here in America. But to do that, American manufacturers need to have access to rare earth materials, which China supplies. So I have a friend who's trying to start a rare earth mine in Missouri, and all he wants the government to do is to just let him put the thorium aside for future use. So I asked him, Jim, how much thorium do you think you'll be pulling up a year? He goes, I think about 5,000 tons. Is that a lot? There was 60 people sitting on the other side of the podium going, do you think there's a stable supply? <laughs> 5,000 tons of thorium would supply the planet with all of its energy for a year. So your one mine would bring up enough thorium without even trying to power the entire planet. It's found in tailings piles. It's found in ash piles. And he goes, and there's like a zillion other places on Earth that are just like my mind. It's a nice mind, but it's not unique. It's not like this is the one place on Earth where this is found. We could use thorium about 200 times more efficiently than we're using uranium now. This reduces the waste generated over uranium by factors of hundreds and by factors of millions over fossil fuels.
Almost all of the nuclear power we use on Earth today uses water as a basic coolant. The heavy water reactor will use about 0.7% of the uranium's energy value, and the light water reactor will use about half of 1%. They both do terrible. You went camping and you built a fire. Stuff on the edge isn't getting burned very good. The same principle. They'll take out a third of the fuel, and then they'll reshuffle the fuel out to the periphery. The solid fuel will begin to swell and crack. This is actually a gap in the fuel. When the fuel swells and the clad can't hold it anymore, it's time to remove the fuel from the reactor. At this point, only a small amount of the energy has been consumed. When we first load nuclear fuel, it is entirely uranium, and most of that is uranium-238. As it burns down to the year, two years, and then three years, you see those are the fission products, and then these transuranics. The hatch at the bottom gives away the fact that the only fraction that has been truly burned is the fraction you see kind of in those light pastel colors. In light water reactors, if you allow fuel to be uncovered and heat up, the zirconium cladding will react with steam to form hydrogen. So they have a series of emergency systems designed to always keep the core covered with water. We saw the failure of this at Fukushima Daiichi. You know, they had multiple backup diesel generators, and each one probably had a very high probability of turning on. The tsunami came and knocked them all out. Anna, tell me what the latest is in relation to the third nuclear explosion. How worried are people? The news, oh, we've had a nuclear explosion. I'm like, no, we didn't. It wasn't a nuclear explosion. It was a hydrogen gas explosion. The oxygen has a covalent bond with two hydrogens, gamma or a neutron. Knock the hydrogens clean off. Let me diss on water a few more times. At normal pressures, water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius. This isn't nearly hot enough to generate electricity effectively. So water-cooled reactors have to run it over 70 atmospheres of pressure. You have to build a water-cooled reactor as a pressure vessel. Number one accident people worry about with this kind of reactor, all of a sudden, pressure is lost in the reactor. Water that's being held 300 Celsius flashes to steam. Its volume increases roughly by a factor of a thousand. This building is the size it is, and it's the way it is, precisely to accommodate this event. When you put water under extreme pressure, like anything else, it wants to get out of that extreme pressure. Physical mechanisms... A dispersion get, term. Yeah, that can mobilize cesium and iodine. Almost all of the aspects of our nuclear reactors today that we find the most challenging can be traced back to the need to have pressurized water. But as long as the reactor was as small as the submarine intermediate reactor, which was only 60 megawatts, then containment shell was absolute. It was safe. But when you went to 1,000 megawatt reactors, you could not guarantee this. Weinberg was the original inventor of the pressurized water reactor. He got his patent for it in 1947. A tricky thing to have the inventor of the light water reactor advocating for something very, very, very different. The molten salt breeder was one thing that he had a feeling in his heart for. Molten salt is one of the best decisions I've made, I think. High temperature is easier than high pressure. He didn't like the fact that it had to run at really high pressure. In some very remote situation, conceive of the containment being breached. Making enough of a stink. Congressional leader named Chet Holofield told Alvin Weinberg, if you're so concerned about the safety of nuclear energy, it might be time for you to leave the nuclear business. And Weinberg was really kind of horrified that they would have this response to him because he wasn't questioning the value or the importance of nuclear energy. He was questioning had the right path been taken. The molten salt reactor experiment was one of the most important and I must say brilliant achievements of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. You nuclear engineers are probably going to think those are fuel rods. They're not. They're graphite. The fuel was a liquid that flowed through channels in this graphite. Instead of having solid fuel and a liquid moderator, liquid fuel and a solid moderator. One of the hardest things to get around is the large, heavy pressure vessel that's required when you use pressurized water reactors. Water actually is really good from a heat transfer perspective. It's good at carrying heat per unit volume. Salts are just as good at carrying heat per unit volume, but salts don't have to be pressurized. And that, if you remember nothing else of what I say tonight, remember that one fact. Once they melt, they have a thousand degrees C of liquid range. Science allows you to look at, at everyday objects for what they really are, chemically and physically. And it really makes you look twice at the world around you. Your table salt is frozen. That's a really strange thing to think about. Your table salt on your kitchen table is it's frozen. A nuclear reactor is a rough place for normal matter. The nice thing about a salt is it's formed from a positive ion and a negative ion, like sodium's positively charged and chlorine's negatively charged. And they go, we're not really going to bond. We're just going to kind of 
associate one with another, you know? And that's what's called an ionic bond. Yeah, you're kind of friends, you know, you're... Facebook friends. Facebook, yeah, Facebook <laughs> friends. All right, well, it turns out this is a really good thing for a reactor because a reactor is going to take those guys and just smack them all over the place with gammas and neutrons and everything. And the good news is, is they don't really care who they particularly are next to. As long as there's an equal number of positive ions and negative ions, the big picture is happy. A salt is composed of the stuff that's in this column, the halogens, and the stuff that's in the, these columns, the alkalis and the alkaline earth. Fluorine is so reactive with everything, but once it's made a salt, a fluoride, then it's incredibly chemically stable and non-reactive. Sodium chloride, table salt, or potassium iodide, they have really high melting points. And we like the lower melting points of fluoride salts. Liquid fluoride reactors with their low pressure operation are particularly suitable to modular construction. Sometimes people go, oh, you're working on liquid fluorine reactors. No, I am not working on liquid fluorine reactors. We're going to with fluoride reactors, and there's a big difference between those two. One is going to explode, the other one is like super duper stable. In the chemical conditions that you have with water, highly oxidized conditions, cesium and iodine are very volatile. Whereas in a salt reactor... There's nothing that cesium loves more than fluorine. It will compete with anything else to grab a hold of fluorine, and cesium fluoride is very low volatility and very high solubility in salt. So no aerosols. Safety is one of the most important reasons to consider very seriously molten salt reactors. And this is because of the clever implementation that was demonstrated in the molten salt reactor experiment of the freeze plug and the drain tank. This is something that perhaps was not getting enough attention in the early 1970s. Now we know that if we want to have the public accept nuclear reactor technology, it has got to be very safe and it has got to be something that is easily explained to people. Now I've explained the safety basis of the molten salt reactor to people many times and I haven't had anyone who's unable to get it. Frozen plug? That's it. That's um, it. A flattened pipe with uh, electrical heat, resistance heat on that one. So you invented the frozen plug room. A small port in the bottom of the reactor. And to keep the port plugged, they had a blower that would blow cool gas over it. So there was a little plug of frozen salt there. Well, if the power went out, the blower turned off, and the heat would melt the frozen plug, and guess what? Psh, everything would drain out of the reactor into this drain tank, and the difference between the drain tank and the reactor vessel was the reactor vessel was not meant to lose any thermal energy. The only place you wanted to lose thermal energy was to give it up in the primary heat exchanger. The drain tank, on the other hand, is designed to maximize the rejection of thermal energy to the environment. And one of the hard things about designing a nuclear reactor is designing it to not lose any heat while you're running it, but then to turn around and try to keep it cool if something goes wrong. So there are two conflicting things. The great thing about uh, liquid fluoride reactors is you can design them completely separately. You can say, here's my reactor and it's designed to make heat, and here's my drain tank and it's designed to cool in all situations. If something happens where that fuel drains away from that graphite, criticality is no longer possible. The reactor is subcritical, fission stops. And there's no way to restart it without reloading the fuel back into the core. This is such a remarkable feature. And it really is unique to having this liquid fuel form and to having something that can operate at standard pressure. You can't do this in solid fuel. You do this in solid fuel, it's called a meltdown. Making solid nuclear fuel is a complicated and expensive process. People recycle cans, they recycle papers. Why not candles? I say we put a bin out, let people bring back their old drippings at their convenience. It's like those bags that say, I used to be a plastic bottle. We could have a bin that said, I used to be another candle. By weight, a paraffin candlestick and gasoline contain about the same amount of energy. Why don't cars run on paraffin wax? Because the inside of your car might need to look like this or like this. What process do we run chemically based on solids? We don't. Everything we do, we use as liquids or gases because we can mix them completely. You can take a liquid, you can fully mix it. You can take a gas, you can fully mix it. You can't take a solid and fully mix it unless you turn it into a liquid or a gas. I shall never forget my wonderment as I stood next to the unshielded steel cans only a few days earlier had been mixed with millions of curies of radioactivity. We were particularly proud of this because that tiny chemical plant was large enough to decontaminate the core of a one gigawatt molten salt breeder. Thorium does not have a volatile hexafluoride. You can fluorinate it and fluorinate it and fluorinate all you want, and it will not change chemical state. It will stay thorium tetrafluoride. Uranium, on the other hand, does have a volatile hexafluoride. 
And this is why many of us feel that the uranium thorium fuel cycle is a perfect fit with a molten salt reactor. This same trick doesn't work, by the way, in uranium plutonium fuels. They both have volatile hexafluorides, and so you can't undergo a separation using the simple technique of fluoride volatility. There really were three options for nuclear energy at the dawn of the nuclear era. Only one of the materials in nature is naturally fissile, and that's uranium-235, which is a very small amount of natural uranium, about 0.7%. This was the form of uranium that could be utilized directly in a nuclear reactor. Most of the uranium was uranium-238. This had to be transformed into another nuclear fuel called plutonium before it could be used. And then there was thorium. And in a similar manner to uranium-238, it also had to be transformed into another nuclear fuel, uranium-233, before it could be used in a reactor. Okay, this is the fast region. This is the thermal region. Squiggly lines, blah, 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 blah. And you could probably tell the entire history of the development of nuclear energy in this one graph. And I'll tell you why. How much energy did the neutron have that you smacked the nuclear fuel with? Okay, how much energy did it have? And then how many neutrons did you kick out when you smacked it through fission? Two is a very significant number in breeder reactors. You need two neutrons. You've got to have one to keep your process going, and you have to have another one to convert fertile material into fissile material. Okay, look at plutonium. Eh. It's that dip below two right there. That's what makes it so you cannot burn up uranium-238 in a thermal spectrum reactor, like a water-cooled reactor. You just can't do it. The physics are against you. And the reality is you do lose some neutrons. You can't build a perfect reactor that doesn't lose any neutrons. So they looked at this and they said, man, we just can't burn uranium-238 in a thermal reactor. It just can't be done. Well, you know, these guys are undeterred. They said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just build a fast reactor because look how good it gets in the fast region. Wow, it gets above two. It gets to three. Wow, this is really good. Well, there's a powerful disincentive to doing it this way, and it has to do with what are called cross-sections. These are a way of describing how likely it is that a nuclear reaction will proceed. Look how much bigger the cross-sections are in thermal than they are in fast. How many of these little dots are we going to need to add up to this size? We're going to need a lot. So this is why it was a big deal to be able to have performance in this region of the curve. Those little bitty dots, they're up here in this part of the curve. Okay, this is the fast region. This is the thermal region. Thorium is more abundant than uranium. All we're consuming now is that very, very, very small sliver of natural uranium. But this is not the big deal. No. It's not a big deal that natural thorium is hundreds of times more abundant than the very small sliver of fissile uranium. The big deal about thorium is that we can consume it in a thermal spectrum. That's the big deal of thorium, is that it can be consumed in a thermal spectrum reactor. When you're talking about a thermal spectrum reactor of any kind, you have to have fuel and you have to have moderator. And they're both essential to the operation of the reactor. The moderator is slowing down the neutrons and when the neutrons have been slowed down, we call them thermal neutrons or a thermal spectrum. In a water-cooled reactor, we use water, specifically the hydrogen in the water, to slow down the neutrons through collisions. The graphite in the molten salt reactor, is that a moderator? Yes, that's the moderator in the reactor. Same idea, except we use graphite as the moderator instead of water. Neutrons go in the graphite, hit the carbon atoms, they lose energy, they slow down. Now why slow it down? That's the difference between you going from that little bitty dot the big dot. That's why you want to slow it down. You want the big dot, not the little bitty dot. A thermal spectrum molten salt reactor has to have the graphite moderator of the core in order to sustain criticality. If the vessel ruptures, recriticality is fundamentally impossible. The drain tank does not have any graphite in it. If something happens where that fuel drains away from that graphite, criticality is no longer possible. The reactor's subcritical fission stops and there's no way to restart it without reloading the fuel back into the core. Now in a fast reactor, on the other hand, you don't depend on moderator. You put enough fuel in the reactor so the criticality is possible even without moderator. In those scenarios, if there's a drain or a spill or something, you need to be careful about what geometries it could get into because recriticality is not, from first principles, impossible. It may be impossible in the design you've designed, but that becomes design specific. Whereas in thermal reactor, it is just impossible. Outside of the lattice of moderator, you, you can't have a, 
criticality setup. A thermal region, look who's doing the best. Look at uranium-233. Look at that. Okay, look at plutonium. Eh, it's that dip below two right there. You just can't do it. The physics are against you. But uranium-233, on the other hand, okay, yeah, it gets a little better in the fast, but dang, it's still pretty dang good right here in the thermal. Big targets, a lot easier. This fact was not well known probably tell about the 70s. There was some data that indicated it, but there was enough uncertainty, even as late as 1969, that the Atomic Energy Commission did not feel like it was a safe bet to go with thorium. Everybody who was pushing thorium said, we like thermal, this is the kind of reactor we want to build. And everybody who was pushing plutonium said, no, 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 we want a fast reactor, that's the only way to do it. And so what happened is they put resources into the plutonium breeder reactor almost from the get-go. They built the experimental breeder reactor one in 1951. So this was the first reactor that made electricity. Four little light bulbs here. This is a mock-up of the core. This size was giving off a megawatt of thermal energy. How tall is this? How many meters? Eight inches. <laughs> this is actual size. That, that's, no, it's scaled down. No, that's full size. EBR1. This was a breeder reactor. It was designed to convert plutonium into energy while making new plutonium. This was not a light water reactor. This predated the light water reactor by years. It was a fast breeder. This is 1951. No kidding. Enrico Fermi and Eugene Wigner saw the future quite a bit differently. Fermi believed that we should really focus our efforts on the fast breeder reactor. It could have a substantial breeding gain. In other words, it could make more fissile material than it was consuming. Eugene Wigner, on the other hand, looked at these same pieces of information and reached a different conclusion, which was that thorium was a superior fuel and that it should be realized in a thermal spectrum, in a thermal breeder reactor. And this opened up a number of possibilities with coolants and reactor configurations. But thorium, in another way, was a, a rather unforgiving fuel. It did not have a great breeding gain like plutonium had the potential in, in the fast spectrum. You had to make sure that you were very careful and conserving of your neutrons. You couldn't waste a lot on losing neutrons to structural materials or losing them to leaks out of the reactor or, or losing them to absorptions in the daughter products of fission. And the thorium also had another challenge. It took about 30 days once it absorbed a neutron to turn into uranium-233. There was a time delay there between when it absorbed a neutron and when it became new fuel. Fermi wondered how it would be that thorium would overcome this problem of the delay from when it absorbed a neutron to when it became new fuel. And Wigner had already seen a possible path forward, which was to do something rather revolutionary, build a nuclear reactor out of liquid fuels rather than out of solid fuels. Now, both thorium and uranium-238 can become nuclear fuels by absorbing a neutron. Now, there's a few steps thorium goes through on this way. It first absorbs a neutron and becomes thorium-233, going from 232 to 233. And then that thorium-233 will decay over a period of about a half an hour into another element, protactinium-233. And protactinium-233 has a half-life, about 30 days. Still, in terms of reactors, that's pretty long. And it drives a lot of what I'm going to talk about with the chemical processing. But ultimately, it will decay to uranium-233, as long as it doesn't absorb a neutron. And, and it has a very quality fission. About 91% of the time, it's going to fission rather than absorb. And that makes... U-233, the best fuel in the thermal spectrum. It outperforms everything else. And it's one of the reasons we really get a kick out of thorium. The process by which we would use thorium in the reactor involves introducing thorium into an outer region of the reactor called the blanket. And in the blanket, the thorium would absorb the neutron. It would take that first step, remember, 232 to 233. It's going to absorb a neutron, and it's going to begin the process of becoming uh, uranium-233. Now, as it takes those steps of decay, turning into other elements, protactinium and then uranium, we can employ a chemical separation to remove that, those new materials from the blanket and then introduce them into the salt that is going to go in the reactor core. And that's the place where the fission reaction is going to take place. That's the place where it's going to generate uh, additional energy. This is the machine that we would like to design. This is the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. It has a reactor vessel made of Hastelloy N. We know that we have to protect this material from the difficult environment it's going to encounter inside the reactor. And so that's why the overwhelming majority of the interior of the reactor is composed of graphite structures. Graphite structures that separate the fuel that flows through these recursive tubes from the blanket. 
And the blanket fluid surrounds the entire core of the reactor. It's hard to see the boundary between the blanket and the core. But that blanket protects the metallic structures from the radiation damage. It protects from neutron flux. It basically keeps that nuclear reaction bottled up in, in, a, in a region of the reactor where it's not going to cause nearly the damage to materials that it would otherwise cause. Uh, for instance, in a one-fluid reactor where you could have fission occurring right up to the very edge of the metallic structure. In a two-fluid reactor, there's a lot of thorium-containing fluid between the edge of the core and the reactor wall that absorbs neutrons, gammas, and radiation flux and prevent it from damaging the material because we know that metal does have some severe issues when it's close to the nuclear reaction. But once this fuel leaves the reactor structure, fission stops. And so there's not an appreciable uh, neutron or, or radiation flux outside the reactor to nearly the degree that there is inside the reactor. So graphite is a very important structural material in this design. It has two different fluids. The uh, primary fuel salt is a highly depleted lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, and uranium tetrafluoride. The blanket fluid is highly depleted lithium, beryllium, and thorium tetrafluorides. And that's where uh, that nuclear absorption of neutrons is taking place and the formation of new fuel. The coolant salt is highly depleted lithium beryllium, uh, simply call it a bear flyb, and that coolant salt then is very chemically compatible in the event that there's ever an in-leakage into the fuel or into the blanket because it's essentially the same solvent of which the blanket and the, the fuel are composed. This is an overall view of the lifter facility. There's the reactor vessel, drain tank, pump, primary heat exchanger. This is the uh, gas heater. It heats uh, carbon dioxide, and there's the carbon dioxide gas turbine. These are uh, chemical processing facilities for the fuel salt and the blanket salt. And then these are off-gas processing facilities for the xenon and krypton to come out of the fuel salt during operation. This is kind of like a kidney for the nuclear reactor. You know, if you imagine that these fluids are like blood, your body does very, very complicated chemical processes all the time in order to keep you alive. It's changing the pH of your blood, it's adding glucose, it's taking out waste products, High efficiency power conversion enabled by the high operating temperature of molten salt. Complete burnup of nuclear fuel enabled by a combination of homogeneous liquid fuel, online chemistry, and thermal breeding, such as Alvin Weinberg and the team at Ornell intended to build until the molten salt breeder program was suddenly terminated. Charles says, stop that MSRE reactor experiment. Fire everybody, just tell them to clear out their desk and go home and send me the money for uh, fast breeders. This is the thorium reactor. Can you tell me what the thinking is on thorium as a fuel, what the advantages are, what the disadvantages are, what the pros and cons are of thorium? The first commercial reactor operated in this country at Chipping Port was based on thorium fuel. My constituents were always asking me about this. Does thorium have a place in our nuclear future? Uh, can you make them work? Yes, you can make them work. Is there an advantage to doing it? I haven't seen it. There's about four times more thorium on Earth than there is uranium. But at the moment, uranium is cheap enough that that simply doesn't matter. It's, I think, one of these sort of technological cults. An atom of thorium and an atom of uranium both contain the same amazing million-fold improvement in energy density over coal. It isn't that an atom of thorium contains any more energy than an atom of uranium, or that natural thorium is much more common than natural uranium. But we don't consume natural uranium in today's reactors. There's about four times more thorium on Earth than there is uranium. Thorium is 400 times as common as uranium-235. And we can't harness the full power of natural uranium with the thorium breeder. That's a bigger challenge. Just like today's reactors, any one piece of fuel will eventually become too used up to sustain fission before its energy potential has been fully realized. It is the semi-fission fuel which then must be reprocessed into new fuel or treated as waste. The elimination of fuel fabrication and the elimination of fuel reprocessing as a distinct step are essential if you want to harvest the smallest amount of natural resources and produce the smallest amount of nuclear waste. Because the economics of nuclear power don't favor reprocessing fuel, it will always be cheaper to simply dig up more uranium rather than using every atom you've already mined. The most environmentally friendly way to operate the thorium breeder is the only way to operate the thorium breeder. If you stop the chemical kidney, 
then fission slowly grinds to a halt. The chemical kidney lets us continually remove used fuel and keep adding fresh fuel. It is how our thorium fuel can be completely converted into energy and fission products. Why nuclear energy? Why molten salt reactor? And why thorium? And last but not the least, why China is the first one to eat the crap? That's Chinese saying. Chinese Academy of Sciences has begun an effort to develop what they call TMSR, Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. It's along these same lines, and they are well-funded and well-staffed. We used to have a dream, if we can produce a clean electricity, then we can drive our electrical car. However, as of today, it's all gasoline cars, so it makes our job even impossible. We need a revolutionary something happen. It's very compelling work. The Chinese are definitely in the lead right now on this. The Y thorium. Y MSR, low pressure here, more safety. We also end up with the high temperature. We need high temperature. Then we can convert the CO2, which is not the waste at all. It's a, it's a raw material for our chemicals, in fact. We need the energy to convert them, but we need the high temperature. China export. A lot of the energy here in China is not for consume, it's for production. We saw the other day how electrical power was used to make steel from recycled materials. We load scrap into large haul trucks and they back up into this bucket and dump scrap inside. A lot of energy consumption is largely industrial processes unbelievably optimized process. There's not the same room for improvement. The nature of waste heat doesn't lend itself very well to conventional Rankin cycles. We probably captured 90% of what's to be captured. Chasing the last 10% is pretty expensive. Those operations couldn't proceed if they thought in two hours they might or might not have power. They would not be able to make steel that way. They have to have reliable energy sources. So you've been able to drop your power consumption per ton almost about a third, it looks like. Probably since the, uh, the mid, early 80s. So besides your scrap material input, what's your next largest cost on production? Electricity. Electricity. This is a recycling facility, an electric arc furnace turns scrap metal into steel alloy for automobiles, consumer products, and infrastructure such as pipes and bridges. This is a sorting facility. We are all familiar with sorting as we put bottles aside for funding drives. Do not mistake sorting for recycling. Sorting is labor intensive. Recycling is energy intensive. This steel recycling plant runs 24 seven. Without reliable clean energy, a closed loop society becomes impossible. Most people don't understand everything you look at, touch, feel, anything that's tangible, there's energy behind it, a lot of it. That was one thing that always attracted me about the notion of exploring space. I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I went to Georgia Tech, got my master's degree there. Now I spent 10 years working at NASA. This is the kind of community I was thinking of. You know, if you were gonna live on the moon or Mars, there was no pit over here and pit over there. Every atom of nitrogen or oxygen or hydrogen became precious to you. And when I would tell people, why were we doing NASA? That was the most effective thing, was the whole idea of recycling and what we would learn from exploring space. What prevents us from doing that right now on Earth? I mean, why do we have to go to space to learn how to be really, really good recyclers? Why don't we recycle like that on Earth? It's energy, you know, energy has to be really, really cheap, or the penalty has to be really, really bad. Now, in space, the penalty was really, really bad. If you didn't recycle, you ran out of air and water. But on the ground, you need to have really, really cheap energy. I worked a lot of my career in solar power systems. It's just that I'm a lot more aware of their limitations. The moon orbits the Earth once a month. For two weeks, the sun goes down, and your solar panels don't make any energy. It's easy to forget about that in our world here on Earth because we're so abstracted from our energy sources. Food is at the grocery store and that we flush the toilet and the waste goes somewhere where somebody takes care of them. And we don't really think about the, the flow of energy that makes all of this possible. With the energy generated, we can actually recycle all of the air, water, and waste products within the lunar community. In fact, doing so would be an absolute requirement for success. We could grow the crops needed to feed the members of the community even during the two-week lunar night using light and power from the reactor. 
it kind of was this microcosm that made it easier for me to understand the bigger picture that we do have going on here on Earth and how we can make that, that bigger picture better, how we can enhance our quality of life on Earth. We're still going to need liquid fuels for vehicles and machinery. We could generate hydrogen by splitting water and combining it with carbon harvested from CO2 in the atmosphere, making fuels like methanol, ammonia, and dimethyl ether, which could be a direct replacement for diesel fuels. Imagine carbon neutral gasoline and diesel, sustainable and self-produced. What molten salt reactors offer is what even cutting edge water cooled reactors like AP1000 can't. Molten salt reactors produce more than just electricity. Molten salt reactors can be used in two ways. So they can be used as a form of electricity generation where it's being attached to the grid. And there are no constraints as to where you can site it. You don't even need it to be near water, which is often a constraint with existing nukes. So you can put it anywhere, really. So if there's a coal-fired power station that's running down, put your molten salt reactor at that point, and there's already the grid you need. So you're just swapping out the source of electricity. The grid's already there. And I think, you know, that's a perfectly viable way for it to go. But I think then also there's heat for industrial uses. You might actually see that come forward first, where these reactors are being sited at, on industrial complexes to provide heat, because there aren't that many sources of low carbon cheap heat. Ammonia, making ammonia, the Hubba Bosch, Bosch process, fractional distillation of crude oil, and catalytic cracking of, of those hydrocarbons. Those three things require temperatures above 450 Celsius. And those three industries are worth two trillion dollars a year. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. The Industrial Revolution and the ability to use chemical fuels was what finally did in slavery. Human beings have had slaves for thousands and thousands of years. And when we learned how to make carbon our slave instead of other human beings, we started to learn how to be able to be civilized people. We live much better lives today because we have learned how to use carbon. Okay, what about thorium? Thorium has a million times the energy density of a carbon-hydrogen bond. What could that mean for human civilization going out thousands, tens of thousands of years into the future? Because we're not going to run out of this stuff. Once we've learned how to use it at this kind of efficiency, we will never run out. It is simply too common. The last operational molten salt reactor shut down in the United States in 1969. It ran in a remote location. Research documents were kept in a walk-in closet. For three decades, we didn't even know this was an option. Then in 2002, Ornell's molten salt documentation is scanned into PDF and made accessible to some NASA employees. 2004, Kirk Sorensen delivers CD-ROMs full of molten salt research to national labs and universities. Dr. Per Peterson receives a copy. 2006, Kirk moves the scanned research onto his website. 2008, molten salt reactor lectures begin at Googleplex, hosted on Google's YouTube channel. 2009, the very first thorium conference is held. Wired Magazine runs a feature story on thorium. 2010, American Scientist runs a feature on thorium. International thorium conferences begin. Server logs show Chinese students downloading molten salt reactor PDFs from Kirk's website. 2011, China announces their intention to build a thorium molten salt reactor. In the US, Flybe Energy is founded. Transatomic Power is founded. 2012, Baroness Bryony Worthington tours Ornell's historic molten salt reactor experiment, which has never been made open to the public. Kun Chen visits Berkeley, California, telling us 300 Chinese are working full-time on molten salt reactors. 2013, Terrestrial Energy is founded. 2014, Thoracon is founded. Moltex is founded. Seaborg Technologies are founded. Copenhagen Atomics are founded. 2015, India reveals their new facility for molten salt preparation and purification. A flood of technical details and technology assessments are released by molten salt startups including Lifter EPRI, a collaboration between Flyb Energy and Southern Company to assess technological readiness of Flyb Energy's molten salt breeder reactor design, the Lifter. 
China announces that now 700 engineers are working on their molten salt reactor program. 2016. Peter Thiel, an investor in the molten salt startup Transatomic Power, contributes over a million dollars to Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Miriam Tonloto releases a feature-length documentary about molten salt reactors called Thorium, the Far Side of Nuclear Power. Dr. James Hansen tells Rolling Stone magazine that we should develop molten salt reactors powered by thorium. Oak Ridge discovers actual film footage of the molten salt reactor itself. Produced in 1969, it was forgotten in storage for over 45 years. It offers up our first and only glimpse of an operating molten salt reactor. 2017 To propel this new era of American energy dominance. First, we will begin to revive and expand our nuclear energy sector, which produces clean, renewable, and emissions-free energy. President Donald Trump observes nuclear power is both a renewable resource and an emissions-free source of energy. A complete review of U.S. nuclear energy policy will help us find new ways to revitalize this crucial energy resource. And I know you're very excited about that, Rick. HR 590, Advanced Nuclear Technology Development Act, is passed through the House of Representatives. Flybe Energy reveals Lifter 49, a new two-fluid reactor designed to turn thorium into life-saving medical isotopes. Just like original Lifter, it is a machine that recycles wasted material such as mine tailings, coal ash piles, and now used fuel rods into enormous amounts of energy. Back in the 60s, Alvin Weinberg saw the molten salt reactor as a means of addressing energy pollution and the need for clean water. Power centers would co-locate energy-intensive manufacturing and small modular reactors. Surplus power would be sold to nearby communities. He knew energy was the ultimate raw material. The more energy you have, the easier it is to recycle and use virgin materials more efficiently. Given enough power, we can pull carbon right out of the atmosphere or ocean. China announced their plans to develop and commercialize a thorium-fueled molten salt reactor in 2011. I'd finally like a president of the United States to know what molten salt reactors are and why they are.